the title of the message is A Prisoner of War. A Prisoner of War. A lot of us are prisoners of war and don't even know it, but today you will. Today you'll figure it out. If you came expecting, it's going to jump right out to you. Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 through 14. Now there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when they falleth, when, when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set, a, set over them taskmasters, Masters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they, they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. In mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was in with rigor. We just went over this in Bible study. Uh, we're doing Exodus. So. They were prisoners of war. Is what they were. General Jonathan Wainwright was the only United States general captured by the enemy during World War II. He was left in charge of Corregidor, Philippines by a superior, General Douglas MacArthur. And when MacArthur left to uh, go to Australia to get a great team to come back and really annihilate the Japanese army, he left one order. He told Wainwright, don't never give up. Stay till the end. Fight to the death. And Wainwright tried. He tried to stick to that. However, the massive, systematic, Merciless destruction of what was he saw going around him. He just didn't have the heart to just let him be annihilated. So he, against his own convictions, he surrendered and became a prisoner of war. He and what was left of his ragtag army were shipped off to prisoner of war camps all throughout Asia. He ended up in Mongolia. Of course, they were happy to have a general. He was the only general that got captured. From our army. <laughs> but he felt like a total failure for having surrendered Corregidor. He reached a point where he depended on a cane just to be able to walk. He became so broken physically. And then he was broken emotionally because he felt like a failure. In due time, Douglas MacArthur led his troops and they went from island to island to island. They annihil annihilated the, the, the Japanese army to the point where he took over Tokyo and he took up residence. And eventually they surrendered. And because Wainwright was in Mongolia further away, the commandant of his POW camp kept a secret. That secret was, we lost the war. So he didn't tell him. So Wainwright, not knowing any better, still submitted as a prisoner of war. But yet he was no longer. In fact, the orders that were given was to the highest ranking officer that was a POW was to do what? Take over the POW camp. So here's a man limping around, frail, barely able to hold himself up with a ragtag bunch of other POW in his camp that's supposed to be in charge, but due to ignorance, the lack of truth, don't miss this, the lack of truth, he submitted as a prisoner of war. Can't you just imagine that commandant knowing that he's, he's not the captor anymore, he's the captive and he ain't telling the truth. He's living that life for just however much longer he can. I don't know how many days it was. But here's this this well-nourished commandant with a force that's much stronger than those that are inside the camp, afraid of this weak, dysentery, 
plague remains of a ragtag army. He's scared. What's he scared of? He's scared of the truth. He's scared of the truth. He's wondering what's going to happen to him when Wainwright, Wainwright figures out he's the one in charge. The only thing, don't miss this, the only thing that enabled the Japanese commandant to keep this fraud up was Wainwright's ignorance to the truth. That's so important. Wainwright had been liberated, but he didn't even know it. Something similar happened 3, 000, over 3,000 years ago. Pharaoh, as we just read, had absolute power in his empire. and had de he, They had defeated every foe within thousands and thousands of miles, so they were so strong. However, he had one nagging fear. And that fear, as we just read, the might of the Israelites, if they ever realized their strength. So we don't want them to realize their strength. The Israelites were shepherds with no weapons. <laughs> Humanly speaking, they were powerless. And Pharaoh feared this. Why? He feared the truth. These people were supposed to be occupying what they had. Don't forget the part about Joseph died. We have a responsibility to pass the truth on to the next generation and the next generation so stuff like this don't happen. Amen? Amen. He knew that if war broke out, he would lose because they would have confrontations with all their enemies and the Israelites were many. His power was based on a lie and no one fears a lie more or fears the truth more than a liar. Amen. And the father of lies, being Satan, he hates the truth altogether. Amen? Satan's greatest fear is identical to Pharaoh's. And that is if the truth was to get manifested in each and every one of us and this sleeping giant that we call a church would actually go to war. Amen. 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 He's afraid that the church will discover there's a war going on and join it. <laughs> now, it's okay to be in here and say, yeah, there's a war, amen, then go outside and pretend there ain't one. That's what Satan wants, right? He wants, you, he wants to stay right here so you're a POW. The core of Satan's fear is that the church will depart from the land. Depart from the land of captivity. See, the church must learn to pray with authority. Uh-oh, here we go about prayer. Pray with authority, not as a POW begging for crumbs. No. But as an advancing army that knows it's destined for victory because of who they're fighting with and for. Amen. Amen. Y'all read the end of the book, right? <laughs> we win! To act like it, amen? amen. <laughs> when you read from Genesis to Revelation, you find out there's a whole lot of trials and storms going on, so don't think you ain't. I mean, we got to go through them too. But we know, I've, I've read the last chapter, we win. <laughs> it's all out war, folks. Although the Bible, all through the Bible, we see examples of Satan enslaving people by hiding the truth from them. So we should learn from that. Dealing wisely with them. Pharaoh said dealing wisely with them. That's another way of saying cheat them. Amen? But we see deliverance come every time God's people discover the truth and access it through prayer. Through prayer. It happened in Egypt with Moses. It happened in Babylonia with Daniel. Daniel. In Persia with Nehemiah, in Acts with Peter and Paul. Truth was revealed and angels are dispatched. Amen. Pharaoh had a three-point plan, if you will. And you know, when we find ourselves in a POW camp, we need to know how we got there. That really helps us to reverse that, right? Well, the first thing he did is he deceived them. He deceived them. The Israelites were never really slaves of Pharaoh. Never. Never. They weren't, but he convinced them otherwise. See, he dealt wisely with them, which, like I said, is a delicate way of saying he cheated or he, he, he lied to them. Joseph's generations, okay, those that had firsthand information of their real status, don't miss this, of their real status, had died. So that's a whole sermon in itself. Are you passing on the legacy of what Jesus' blood did for you to your to your descendants. Because if not, there's extermination. 
you become a slave. And if you don't, your next generation will. Pharaoh never wielded a weapon. He simply hid the truth from them. Their ignorance made him powerful. We have turned the battlefield that we're supposed to own, you and I, the church, the body, where we're supposed to occupy victoriously into a massive POW camp. Wow, it got quiet in here. See, we've become content with surviving rather than overcoming. I said, that was a good one. I'm get a few more amens. I'll say it again. We have become content with surviving rather than overcoming. Amen. Amen. We have believed the lie that we are not to engage the enemy. So, so many people need to hear this. So we've been deceived. We have been deceived by Satan that we're not to approach or attack the enemy. And I'll tell you, if Satan convinces somebody in my family to do something that is an abomination of God, I'm going to let him know. Are you? Amen. Are you? Amen. There are so many of us that just sweep it under the carpet or try to go with whatever's PR. Yep. PC, I guess. Political correctness. What's PR? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Public relations. Okay. So many families are torn apart right in the church because somebody succumbs or submits to a lie from the devil that it's okay. There's even churches practicing things that are an abomination of God. The next thing is he, dom he denominates them. He dominates them. Denomination? That's almost like being dominated. <laughs> anyway. He dominates them. Amen. Deception always breeds domination if there's manipulation going on it's so that they can overcome you the Egyptians appointed taskmasters to overwhelm the Israelites with abuse designed to obliterate the possibility of escape in their mind you win the battle if you just give up a lot of people do when they're going through their storms he does this by causing us so to he, he Satan does this to us for us to oh this is Y'all might want to take notes on this. This is going to confuse you. You confuse your trials with your burdens. You confuse your trials with your burdens. And Satan has... He's taken root in the church to where we think everything's a trial. When there's burdens straight from Satan that we should bind up. Amen? Amen? We have this POW mentality that we accept that he has the right to abuse us. Oh, yes, we do. There's plenty. Because we believe that God has all power, and he does, amen. amen. We think that God approves of this abuse. Oh, yes, there is. Plenty of people that think that. We find ourselves thanking God for the trials when we're really their burdens imposed by Satan. Trials bring with them the necessary grace, folks. Listen, because I know some people are going, okay, you said it, now tell me what the difference is, amen? Trials bring with them the grace to endure. The grace to endure, while burdens are meant to destroy. And it's crucial that we can distinguish the difference. So let me give you a little example. A trial is like undergoing surgery in the best hospital. Now they cut you open with a knife and you bleed and there's possible you could get infection a burden is like being stabbed by a mugger they cut you and there's blood and there's possibility of infection what's the difference intent intent so when you're going through what you think's a trial you pray and you ask God to show you because he will and if it's not to strengthen you, it's to break you down. And if it's to break you down, it's not of God. It's not approved. And you have dominion over that. Put your foot on the devil's neck. Amen? Amen. Yes, sir. Intent. When burdens appear, don't welcome them. Resist them. I mean, welcoming a burden is like me going over here and going, boom, 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 boom. Just so I can see if it feels better when I get done. Amen? <laughs> Last one. <laughs> he began to destroy them. Pharaoh ordered all Israelite baby boys to be destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> yep. See, the genius of this scheme 
is that there was a false grace there. And some of the folks in Bible studies are going, you didn't bring that up. I didn't want to give you all, everything. I didn't want you to know. Pharaoh appeared gracious like a POW commandant feels, appears gracious when he takes a starving POW and allows him to have a care package on Christmas. What he did was he didn't totally annihilate him. He allowed them to have their daughters. And that's a false grace. And so the Israelites accepted this. Do you see the difference? Pharaoh's ultimate objective was to destroy their fruitfulness. Why only the baby boys? Well, you know they're going to be soldiers, right? <laughs> Satan's strategy has been to remove every reference to spiritual warfare from years of my vocabulary. That's why we accept some of the things in our own lives and certainly in our family's lives. There's nobody in here don't have family members that you should be saying something to out of love. But don't. It, it's Satan that has misconstrued the scripture that says, Judge not lest ye be judged. Because if you'll just read all of it, tonight you'll learn what it really means. Amen. Amen. Don't just read a few words and not do anything about it. Amen. General Pat, during World War II once welcomed a batch of new recruits with these words, quote, Welcome to Europe and to the war. I'm sure some high-ranking jerk back in the States has told you that the secret to winning the war is to die for your country. <laughs> this is not so. The secret to winning the war is to make the enemy die for his country. End of quote. Amen. The same principle holds true today for you and me on the spiritual battlefield against Satan and his little peons. Amen. It's all right to lose graciously once in a while. But brothers and sisters, if the gospel of Jesus Christ is to be taken to all the ends of the earth by us, we better start winning graciously now. Amen. Amen. There is a war. The same principle. I mean, Pharaoh has created conditions of total chaos within the Israelites. So Israel's in total despair. The people have been transformed from a privileged nation within the Egyptian empire into a nameless mass of slaves saddled with the most demanding tasks. And they're headed for extermination. What broke it free? The power of prayer. The power of prayer. Exodus 2, 23-25 says, And it came to pass in process of time that's a while. That the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried. They cried, they prayed. And their cry came up to God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. Prayer turned deception into... Prayer turned domination into... Prayer turned destruction into divine deliverance. Amen. Amen. Prayer did that. Pharaoh's power was broken and God's power was released. And two million slaves were set free. Amen. See, without prayer, Exodus would just be a two-chapter book. It would. But there's 38 more chapters because it talks about God's answer to the prayer. Amen. Israel had no army. Israel had no economic power, no social status. Their only weapon was prayer. Amen. That's awesome, isn't it? That's awesome. The difference between prayer is we usually conceive it. <laughs> this is going to hurt. And the kind the early church then had is the same as swimming in a hot tub versus swimming in an open ocean and can't see the, you can't see the shore for anywhere you look. That's the difference in their fervent prayer and what we pray today. So many of us pray and then we put on Facebook that nobody loves us and then our prayer ain't going to happen. Prayer ain't going to be answered. Hello. I had a guy come to my lane one day. He wanted some money. And I said, well, I can't give you any money. I'll pray with you. And he's like, well, okay. <laughs> Just like that. Prayer. Like you're in an ocean. With no shores. The principles of prayer. What is the secret of effective prayer? Well, we need to realize we got some authority. We pray as if it's just us praying. 
We have the authority to pray. <laughs> Prayer is something that happens on this side of heaven. Amen. It is something for which man is expected to do. God has restricted himself for praying. He has get, left it for us to do. We have to pray. Amen. Our prayer is what makes it happen. Man pleads, God gives. Man knocks, God opens. Man asks, Amen. <laughs> the initiative rests with man. <laughs> God restricted himself with that. Amen. Prayer operates in the realm of God's self-imposed limitations on prayer and on shining our light for Him. Yep. Amen? These are the areas that God, for reasons unknown to us, because He's God, chose to limit His options and consequently His freedom of action. One of these areas is preaching and the other, preaching the gospel, shining our light. He doesn't do that. We do it. He gives us the power to do it. We're supposed to go do it. Just like in prayer, we have to pray. Prayer is crucial and it's central. But Satan is a sore loser. Even though we have dominion, even though we have the authority, he's not willing to vacate. He's waiting for somebody to tell you that your commander-in-chief is one. So you can go and tell the, the commandant that it's your office, that it's your property. That's why we have the Holy Ghost. On Pentecost, the, Pentecost, the disciples were given the badge that badge was to certify that they could knock on doors and evict. Amen. You ready to do some evictions? When the enemy resists, the judge morally and legally free to confront him. And do you know when legal paper, ser legal paper is served, they hardly ever yell, they hardly ever raise their voice. They don't have to. You know why? Because of the authority that they have. Amen? The authority. We have authority. It says in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and all over the power of and, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Amen. But do we believe that when we're praying that we have that authority and that power? That power comes from God. See, what the first Adam lost through disobedience, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, recovered through obedience. Amen. Amen. And now the church must repossess what belongs to it. Right. We need to repossess it. God's power is the engine of prayer. It's the engine of prayer. Man's authority is the steering wheel. You know, the engine has raw power. It's got all that power, but we use the steering wheel. Amen? So eventually, back to the story, an allied airplane lands nearby. General Wainwright, where he's in prison, guy walks up, soldier walks up and salutes Wainwright and tells him the war's over. says, General, Japan has surrendered. Now armed with the truth, armed with the truth, this weak and frail man with a cane limps all the way to the commandant's office and goes in. And he simply says, Your commander-in-chief has lost. My commander-in-chief has won. You must surrender today. No weapons. Just the truth. He had that authority. And he realized he had that authority. He didn't raise his voice. Probably couldn't at that point. If you see the pictures, look them up. Google him. Frail man. He was able to do it because of the truth. And this is the kind of authority in prayer that is required to reach our cities. It's the kind of authority in prayer that's to reach our families. Amen. We have to engage the enemy. When General Wainwright was flown to Japan in time for the surrender, he dreaded the moment that he would see MacArthur. Uh, MacArthur. In spite of having been liberated and being free, he was still full of shame. Some of us are relating to this. You're free, God's forgiven you, and you still... You get the shame. You're just in your own little POW camp. Something that's happened in the past. You got that shame on you. And you're afraid to face the general. Wainwright didn't want to see MacArthur. 
and he tried to hide in a corner as MacArthur was walking by. Well, MacArthur, it wasn't too hard to figure out which one was him. He's nice skinny and everybody else still bold. He said, Wainwright, come over here. And when General Wainwright got in front of MacArthur, he started weeping. Tears flowed down because of his shame. Wainwright self-imposed shame. And General MacArthur embraced him and says, it's okay. You did the best you could. You did okay. At the surrender ceremony that followed shortly afterward, every general, admiral, and brigadier assigned <laughs> tried to jockey for a spot next to MacArthur. Much usual. Anybody that's been in the military, you know how that works. All them strap hangers. <laughs> in this classic style, MacArthur put all of them behind him except for two other generals. The British General Percival who had surrendered Singapore at the beginning and General Wainwright who had surrendered Corregidor. He put one on his right and one on his left. Corregidor, uh, Wainwright on his right. And after he signed the agreement, the unconditional agreement of surrender for Japan, he gave a pen to each one of them. And in doing so, he was saying, I know you lost a few battles, but it's okay. We're going to win the war. Amen. We have won the war. We have won the war. So perhaps in closing, you feel like Wainwright did because of a past failure. Maybe you're still living in a POW camp. Your own POW camp. And you know who you are. I'm telling you today, your commander-in-chief is telling you to tell that commander-in-chief, he has won. They must surrender. You're in charge now. Amen. Amen. You are in charge now. I would encourage you to look up to your supreme commander right now and close your eyes and just thank him. <laughs> and just thank him. Amen. Amen. Pick yourself up. Charge against the strongholds. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this message, Lord. And I know that there's many in here right now that were touched and they know that they had their own personal POW camp that they're residing in. Lord, I pray you continue to give them strength to stand on this message that was heard this morning and to go to Satan who is the father of all lies and let him know right now that we know the truth and that our commander in chief has won this war and that because of his authority we have dominion over him. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Glory to God.